So here is a linear programming problem that we are going to solve using the simplex algorithm. Why don't you take a moment and pause the video, read the question, and try to form in your mind what your constraints and objective function are going to look like. And then when you return, we'll proceed. So go ahead and pause the video. All right, so welcome back. So what you notice we have is we have resources here. We have 150 units of flour. We have 90 of sugar and we have 150 of raisins. So we know that organizing this information, we have raisin bread and we have raisin cake. Who wouldn't want the cake? So a loaf of raisin bread requires one unit of flour, one unit of sugar, and two units of raisins. Raisin cake needs five units of flour, two sugar, and one unit of raisins. All right. So we are told that, and we're also told that raisin bread sells for $1.75 a loaf. And raisin cake sells for $4 a loaf. Of course, who wouldn't pay more for cake, right? So we want to know how many of each should be baked so that gross income is maximized. So I'm so my variables are quite clearly the number of loaves of raisin bread I'm going to sell and the number of loaves of raisin cake that I'm going to sell. And we are told that the flour, so going back to that original color here, the units of flour available are 150. So flour plus flour is less than or equal to 150. We have the number of units of sugar are less than or equal to 90. And the number of units of raisins is less than or equal to 150. So there's our constraints. So it looks like, here's our linear programming problem. We want to maximize... And I'll call the objective function z because that's just what we do, right? It looks like 1.75x1 plus 4x2. Subject 2. Well, so it looks like x1 plus 5x2 less than or equal to 150. x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 90. And 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 150. And an automatic constraint is that my variables have to be non-negative. So this is indeed a standard maximization problem, which therefore means we can solve it using the simplex method. So just remember how everything gets set up here. We're going to have to introduce slack variables to each one of these constraints here. One, two, three. So we're going to have an S1, an S2, and an S3. And remember that we write the z equation in that weird form where we put the negatives plus z equals zero. Once we do that, here is the initial simplex table. And we're going to try to put all the information there so we can see exactly where everything came from. So first constraint, first line, x1, 5x2, that gets the s1, the slack variable. And the slack variables just kind of go diagonally until you hit z. And there we go. So that's our initial simplex table. So the first thing we do remember, we look for the most negative entry in the bottom row, and that corresponds to x2. And that, remember, means that if I'm going to introduce x2 into this system, I'm going to try to use as much as I can, right? So remember, we now look at ratios of the right-hand side to the x2, because that tells us the highest number of x2s we can introduce before we bump constraints. So 150 divided by 5 is 30, 90 divided by 2 is 45, and 150 divided by 1 is 150. So the 30 wins, okay? So that means that this 5 right here is our pivot. So remember what we do with the pivot. We use that row to make all the other entries below it 0. So calling this R1, R2, R3, 
R4, we're going to have to do row operations to make zeros below the others. So here's what we do. Um, so if R1 is the pivot row, it's going to appear in each of my row operations. So we're going to have R1 and R2 to make a new R2, R1 and R3 to make a new R3, R1 and R4 to make a new R4. So looking at R1 and R2, it looks like I need to take, I'm going to take negative 2 R1 and add 5 R2 to get a new R2. I'm going to take negative R1 and add 5 R3s to get R3 because negative 5 plus 5 is 0. And for R1 and R4, it looks like the magic number is 20. So I'm going to take 4 R1 and 5 R4 to make a new R4. So I encourage you to try those row operations on your own. Pause the video. And when you come back, I will scroll to the next matrix, the next table. And we're going to get to see if it's an optimal solution or not. And I'm going to do that. Here's the next table. And we notice that we're not optimal yet because we have this negative entry here in the bottom row, which tells us I can still add more of that variable. This is the x1 variable, by the way. Remember, this is x1, x2, s1, s2, s3, z, right-hand side. And looking at that, what you notice is x2 has entered, and now s1, when x2 enters, that means we no longer have slack in the first equation. That was the ratio that won last time. So that means s1 is out. So we're almost there. Now this one's gonna get a little bit more uh, tricky. We compare the ratios again uh, on the first three lines to see which one is gonna be our pivot. 150 over one is 150. 150 over three is 50. 600 over nine is, well, that's 200 over three, which is 66 and two thirds. Bottom line is the 50 wins, so that's our pivot. And we go through the whole thing again. So it looks like R2 is going to be involved in each step. So I'm just going to set up the stage here for us. Oops, that should be R1 there, not R2. So what numbers are we going to be multiplying by? Well, I want to take a 3 and add it to a 1. So I'm going to take negative R2 and add 3 R1. In R, comparing R2 and R3, we'll say the magic number is 9 because 3 goes into 9. So I'm going to take negative 3 R2 and add R3. That one was kind of easy. This last one is kind of tricky. Um, instead of dealing with 4.75, finding lowest common denominator, I am just going to take 4.75 R2s and 3 R4s. And that will create the number that will cancel out to create a new R4. So again, I, can, I encourage you to pause the video right here, work the problem out. And then when you get back, we'll go to the next tab below. And we're going to see what the solution is there. And here it is. Well, would you look at that? We have reached optimality. Remember, we know we're optimal when the bottom row has no negative entries. So I am going to highlight all of the columns that correspond to basic variables. Remember, we know it's a basic variable if it contains all but one non-zero entry. So let's read the solution. So for the x1 column, it looks like 3x1 is equal to 150, which means x1 is equal to 50. It looks like 15x2 is equal to 300 which means x2 is equal to 20. It looks like 5s3 is equal to 150, which means s3 is 150. I'm sorry, 50, not 150. And it looks like the rest are 0. s1 and s2 are 0. And it looks like 15z, are the one we're trying to optimize, is equal to 250, 2512.5 which means Z is, uh, if we divide that, we get 167.5, I believe. Okay, now interesting thing here, while we're here, let's analyze the slack variable. I mean, X1 and X2, pretty obvious. We're going to make 50 loaves of bread and 20 cakes, 
in order to maximize the profit. So considering this, look at S3 equals 50. Now, S3 corresponded to which equation? If I come back up here to the original problem, that came from the raisins. So this means that to optimize revenue, in this case, we're bringing money in, to optimize revenue, we're going to have some raisins left over. And that's okay. But that's what the S3 tells us. S1 and S2 are both zero, which means I'm using all the flour I have available and all the sugar I have available. But again, we're going to have 30 units of raisins left over after producing at a maximum level. So hopefully that helps you solve these problems and set them up a little bit more efficiently. Um, I'm a big proponent of making tables to organize the information. This way you can see which way the constraints move as you see what, we, what I did right here. Um, and I encourage you to watch more videos. I'll be posting some more. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this.